this is uh, going to be Tools, Culture, and Aesthetics, the Art of DevOps. By the way, feel free to raise your hand if you don't understand my English either. Um, <laughs> I, did a, I did a time conversion, and it's midnight. We're at home right now. So I'd normally be staring at this, then uh, being here with all of my folks, and be uh, getting ready to kick her off, kick the beast off the bed. Uh, so I have some space. So um, I'm glad to be here. Um, a little bit about me. My name, uh, as was said, is Paul Reed. Uh, and this is mostly about uh, Twitter. Uh, my uh, name on Twitter is Jay Paul Reed. Actually, if you heard Sober Build End on Twitter, I recently changed it. Uh, but that, the both of those accounts will go with me. Um, uh, Sharon mentioned the, uh, the ship show. Uh, and uh, I'm a host on there. My background is uh, release engineering, and I talk to people about the DevOps. Um, if podcasts are your thing, check out the ship show. This is mostly about the, our awesome co hosts. They really make the show shine. So uh, let's start uh, with a little bit of a survey. Um, because I go to a lot of different DevOps based events, and um, it's always interesting uh, the makeup of the community in a DevOps based event. So uh, raise your hand if you describe yourself as a developer. Okay. Raise your hand if you would describe yourself as an operations person. Raise your hand if you would describe yourself as QA, release engineering, anything like that. I see one, one, one two. Yes, release engineers or QA people. Uh, what, uh, if you describe yourself as the business, product management, business people, right? Are there any describe themselves as other? <laughs> <laughs> cool, awesome. Okay, so uh, a good mix of dev and ops. I uh, will dev heavy. That's awesome. Um, so uh, for this next uh, survey question I have for you, I, I want you to get out if you have something to write with or get out your phones and get out the notes app real quick. We'll come back to this, but everyone pick out your pick out something to write with your, your phone and note app. And um, write down the first words that come into your mind when you hear or see the word dev I'll give you uh, about 20 seconds to do that. So when I say DevOps, you say... Okay, we set that aside. Keep it, we'll actually come back to it. We'll take a look at it in the context of the presentation. So, uh, we're just about a month away from uh, the sixth birthday of DevOps days, uh, and sort of the, the word DevOps. Um, and so a lot of people have been starting to look at this, the fact that, uh, you know, the fifth year anniversary is last year, and, and uh, we're coming up on this, uh, you know, anniversary time again. So I did sort of this thing, you know, the Google thing where you say, uh, my six-year-old is, and, uh, I don't know who six-year-old is, maybe there's some parents that have some six-year-old. My six-year-old is me driving me crazy, stealing, or lazy. Um, does, does anyone feel like DevOps sometimes, like, uh, is me? Is driving me crazy? kind of interesting to, to think about. Um, you know, as, as DevOps matured, one of the really big questions is, and you know, we try to sort of scale it beyond uh, our original thinking about DevOps, uh, is the big question is then, is it uh, ready uh, for the enterprise? Uh, this is a CIO journal uh, from an article in 2014 saying, nah, I don't think, I don't think it will. You know, does DevOps apply to everyone? That's good. Uh, there are people no. Then, of course, uh, you have uh, another article after that saying the results are in enterprise DevOps is real. The funny thing about this is these articles are actually two months apart. Uh, so there's a little bit, I think, of uh, disagreement on whether or not uh, DevOps, enterprise DevOps is, is uh, ready for prime time. What's interesting to think about here is this idea that DevOps is growing up, um, that is becoming more mature, that we're finding it in different places. And you might think to yourself, well, um, where, what, you know, if you did that a metaphor, what do you do if your child grows up to send them off to school? So I did this experiment again uh, with if you send them off my kindergarten, doesn't listen to school, is being bullied, is crying at school, is exhausted. Um, it's kind of fun to consider is uh, enterprise DevOps the same as DevOps being sent to school? Uh, is, it, is, is the enterprise bullying DevOps? Uh, it's kind of fun to think about. Uh, a lot of people who, who spend a lot of time thinking about DevOps, uh, about how to roll it out in organizations, this has become kind of a hot topic this last year. Uh, this is Baron Schwartz, he's giving uh, an article he wrote uh, in January this year, uh, talking about the DevOps identity crisis. And in it, he actually argues that we need a manifesto, or the problem 
um, is that DevOps might not be cohesive enough to stick together uh, if there isn't a manifesto. Um, but of course, the manifesto has uh, steadfastly been refused by a lot of people in the space. Uh, this is Michael Keyes from O'Reilly Publishing saying, uh, I might define DevOps as the movement that doesn't want to be defined. <laughs> um, sort of this idea of the negative space. I thought it was interesting, uh, Patrick um, coined the term, Patrick Roth, if you're with him, uh, in Belgium, uh, coined the term DevOps. Uh, this was from last year. He said, uh, he's, I think he's slowly outgrowing DevOps and then moving into the philosophy of the IT. It's kind of an interesting way to put it. Of course, uh, later, uh, about a month later, he said, Imagine you went to the show and you decided to read any DevOps like you did with Hudson and Jenkins. <laughs> um, it's interesting to note that uh, Hudson and Jenkins definitely read any people of Oracle, which is again a corporate influence. So it's kind of interesting he made that particular analogy in his tweet. So six years in, we're experiencing tension. Uh, manifesto, not manifesto. Uh, how do we define it? Um, how can we know what it is if we don't define it? How can we discuss it if we can't define it? So, Interesting to look at where is this tension coming from. And a lot of this is coming from sort of this idea that we need to scale. Um, I, I went out searching it's about a year ago. Uh, this is the complete DevOps certification kit. It is real, it's on Amazon, it costs 300 bucks. So you can get totally certified. Uh, there's another company, uh, literally you could download DevOps. <laughs> download it. Get the, by the way, get, get the data sheet. You can get so many hours and just download the data sheet. Yeah, it's all. Yeah, it's all. Uh, get the data sheet before you download um, So, what's interesting about this is why, why are we seeing things like this? You know, it's because companies want to be able to replicate the DevOps. They want to replicate uh, the experience that the unicorn companies have had. Now, are people familiar with the phrase unicorn companies? Is that, people know that phrase? Um, <laughs> I don't know, whenever I hear you know about this, I just think of this, and I've been fat eating that cash. Um, but unicorn companies, name some. Name some unicorn companies. Uber, Uber, Uber Airbnb, that's interesting that you went right there. Uh, we should talk about that. Any other ones though? Netflix, yes. Evernote. Evernote, that's an interesting one. One more. Automatic. Facebook, all right, cool. Yes. So Netflix, Facebook, Etsy. Yeah, yeah. So actually, uh, Uber Airbnb one is, is interesting. My roommate's a city planner, so we have a lot of conversations about Uber and Airbnb because uh, there's a lot of impacts in that particular way that have both disrupted that market. Uh, but yeah, so you hear this, this around the, the unicorn companies, uh, and these are a smattering of them. I actually did a report for I called that Option Practice. There's some other ones, uh, it's just, the, the report is about Nordstrom and Texas.gov. There's some other unicorn companies too. Uh, Jess Humble likes to say unicorns are just horses with better PR. Um, and I think that's, that's the case, especially the example of these, these companies. So how many people have tried to take a pattern that they've read about uh, one of these companies doing and try to replicate it? Wholesalers, copy it, see how it works out. Yeah, and, and how did it work out? Good, bad, bad, yeah. At least somewhat, probably inconsistently, right? We didn't have a repeatable pattern. They didn't give us a repeatable pattern. Um, it's it's kind of interesting, uh, you know, it's, uh, when you talk about like, look, look at how that is such DevOps, or you know, this idea of the DevOps uh, architecture that Facebook is using, sort of thing. Uh, so I kind of wanted to go back to basics. So I, I went and surveyed 50 people who you might consider thought leaders throughout the space. There's going to be some names and faces you recognize. And I just asked them, uh, I, to do the exercise that I asked you to do, what words pop into your head when you hear DevOps? <laughs> now, my question for you to think about is, does this surprise you? I mean, obviously, there are a couple of words, a couple of words that stand out pretty big. Uh, there's a couple of ones in here that are actually fairly interesting. Um, uh, I'm curious, how many people uh, had one word that matched. How about two words? Yeah. Yeah, the small ones are pretty hard to see, but at least the one you can see. I'm just curious to sort of reflect on, on whether. Yeah. Well, so actually, I was going to put that. Some of the ones you can't see. Uh, bullshit is in there. Uh, Sigh is in there. Oh, oh no is in there. I think my favorite one is enterprise corruption. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> um, out of curiosity, how many people in there when they were making their list wrote words in a different language? I ask that question just because it's interesting to think about uh, the context when you translate a word, uh, you know, and, and obviously this is all in English, but if you would jot, jotting down uh, words in a different language, if they sort of match in the, in the context of that. So, uh, you might ask yourself, okay, well that's interesting, why are the words important? Uh, why is the language, why is that thing I just asked, why is that even important? No. So, Dave Snowden is an academic who talks a lot about complexity theory. If you've heard of the Panetta model, we actually won't talk a lot about Panetta, but if you've heard of it, that's Dave's baby. He recently said the language of description is the language of intervention. Um, so, that is, for us to intervene, to affect the system, to discuss it, to discuss pros and cons, we actually need to have sort of a shared language to actually describe it. So, a lot of people actually, um, you know, you may be reading some like aesthetics. What, what is that? I have to go back to like high school uh, philosophy or, or college philosophy. Like, did we once talk about that? Yeah, we did. So, I just take this definition to remind everyone uh, from Wikipedia, a branch of philosophy deals with the nature of art, beauty, and taste, and the nature of the creation and appreciation of beauty. So you might say, well, how's that a relevant all? A couple of interesting uh, areas, uh, specializations of aesthetic, aesthetic, aesthetics, experimental aesthetics, uh, is actually one of the oldest, uh, second uh, oldest areas of psychology. So psychologists started uh, trying to understand, well, when we experience something beautiful, what does that actually look like in our brain? How does that, how do we do without our emotional level? And it's pretty interesting that it's actually the second oldest area of psychology. Um, and then how can we test that? This is where they use testing to like functional MRIs and, and doing eye tracking studies and things. It comes from experimental aesthetics. In contrast, neuroaesthetics is much newer. It's about 2002, and it was actually the idea that now we have all this technology at a neurological level. What chemical uh, things are happening in our brains when we see something ugly or pretty or, or disgusting? What reactions do we have that we are not maybe even aware of? Um, and then, of course, applied aesthetics, that's actually what we're going to talk about today. That's what we care about uh, today. Um, and it's what you would expect. It's, you know, aesthetically pleasing in fashion. I will show you. Do we have any foodies in the audience? Yes, I, I also am a foodie. So gastronomy is a fancy way of saying I'm a foodie. But certainly that area. And what's interesting, if you look in the research literature, uh, they talk about it in IT too. So websites, web browsers have been huge uh, topics of study, probably because they were uh, being developed and, and coming along if you ever use Netscape or no, right? Um, they were coming out as sort of uh, the new area to study in cloud aesthetics. Um, one interesting area, there, there's a new area that we're talking about sort of source code aesthetics and algorithmic aesthetics. Uh, and there's some real overlap with computer science there. What, what is a beautiful, what constitutes a beautiful algorithm? So we could spend the whole time on this. Um, I'm not going to. Um, so I want us to think about aesthetics in the context in which we work, uh, specifically the operational aesthetics. So this is Sanea Airport, it's a train maps. So there, you, know, you might notice patterns begin to emerge. Certain things are chaotic, certain things are very uh, more ordered, this little thing down here going back and forth. Uh, processes accrete and, and uh, patterns sort of become very established uh, when we sort of look at uh, aesthetics in an operational context. Um, a friend of mine sort of said it best, uh, there's beauty in things done well. Right? This idea that when we have an operational system, like a website or a service, uh, that we need to provide uh, and make sure it's up and running all the time, uh, that there's sort of beauty in it, and that works well. So back to the unicorns for a second. Um, if you had to describe sort of Facebook's, the company's aesthetic of itself, um, what, my, how might you do that? Um, you might have heard what phrase they always use? The Facebook ethic or aesthetic. Move fast and break things? Yep. So what's interesting about that is you may have noticed about a year ago, I think. <laughs> they changed it. Yeah, move fast and stable at first order. I gotta say, I don't know that I believe they really changed it. I think they maybe marketing changed it, but I don't work at Facebook. So I have to take what they say at face value. Um, but that, that got them through the first part, but that's the right thing is with very big uh, uh, company culture and stuff. So these are things that they uh, are pleasing 
that you can't tell the developer's name actually comes from a Facebook developer named um, an ops person named Phil Bibowitz. Um, and he said it a, a few times in, in um, talks that he's given about Facebook. And the context he's talking is we had to develop infrastructure so that the developers could do what they needed to do. So if the developer came in and said, you know, I want to control these sysctls on, on a million servers, they, they as an aesthetic value, Facebook said, no, you, you can't tell the developers no. You need to architect a solution to let developers have the freedom to do that. And then one of these talks is actually about how to do that, so that's kind of fascinating um, in, in that particular context. So Netflix, what's the one we've always heard? Freedom and responsibility. Yeah, it's one of the big things in our culture now. Um, another one that people like to talk about, contact not control. So give people contacts, don't try to control them. Um, when you put in the other ones, adequate performance gets a generous severance package. Um, Winter is coming. What? Winter is coming. Yes. Yes, winter is coming. Red, red, red wedding somewhere in there. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is all in the culture deck. So these are the things that they find uh, sort of aesthetically pleasing things like that. Amazon. Data driven, always. Right? They're a big. Uh, data These are ones, by the way, I, I sort of came up with, so that it's not like I particularly have a culture deck, but if you ever talk to an Amazon person or listen to Jeff Bezos talk in the, in the media, the tech media, um, you know what you're getting into if you take a, a position on Amazon. They're very data driven. Uh, this is my interpretation about DD Leader Blue and Four Strategy. That comes from uh, the story about Jeff Bezos back, probably I think it was 2000. Four or five, I'd have to look it up. But when he sent out around that famous memo that said, You will make everything a service. I don't care how you make the service accessible, but you will expose it via APIs. And if you don't want to do that, you will leave. And that memo got leaked, right? But what's interesting part of the story that doesn't get told is he actually had someone, he hired someone who I believe was an um, ex -air, uh, military person. Uh, and he sent that person around to different teams in the company to make sure that they were doing that particular memo. It mattered that much. Now that strategy turned out to work out very well for Amazon. You might say it was the right thing to do. And of course, this is kind of the implicit point that I'm trying to make is that with aesthetics, we can talk about, well, was it a good thing or, or a bad thing? Um, we can have the language to actually talk about it. So uh, I don't know if the New York Times article uh, made as big a splash over here as it did over there, the New York Times article about Amazon about putting in your four years uh, and, and what a difficult place it is to, to work there. Um, and sort of some of the kind of horrendous stories that came out from that. Um, but I put this in there because uh, I was actually talking to some people that interviewed there and some people that took positions there and they were saying, yeah, it's also somewhat well known that it is a great idea and you're just put your four years in there and make, make your money um, because their stock seems to be doing pretty well. And then, and then leave. Um, so that uh, might be a shared step. Now, what is notable here is that we consider all of these unicorn companies successful companies, but their sort of professed values, the things that they find beautiful, are clearly very different if you compare them. So I said this at DevOps Stage Rockies earlier this year. I said culture is not important. We talked a lot about culture in DevOps. Culture is not important, but uh, cultural alignment is critical. Um, I actually uh, would rephrase that um, today to say culture is not important, but shared aesthetic is critical. The reason that I actually made that change is uh, I was uh, chatting with uh, Dave Snowden about this, and he was pointing out that um, alignment in a complex system is actually bad because it reduces the adaptive capacity of that system. If everybody is aligned, you reduce the diversity. Um, shared aesthetic is different than cultural alignment. Um, the values are similar, but we can still have a meaningful conversation about, uh, you know, we all might like humans paintings, but we can talk about which paintings in that genre we like better or more so well. So it's a little different than that. So I want you to take a moment and think about uh, what are your aesthetics of DevOps? Um, would they include any of the words that you used before that you wrote down? Um, it's interesting to think about what are your team's aesthetics? Talking about that a lot. What's uh, what's your organization? Um, would you describe them as shared? Would you think that they align? Well, align is a bad word, but do you, would, you, would those three groups share those values? So I surveyed the same people that I was talking about before. 
uh, the same 50 DevOps thought leaders, kind of hate that word, but I think actually most of them want us to hate that word too. Um, but uh, that's the easiest way to communicate uh, sort of what I'm talking about. So I asked them, what are their aesthetics of DevOps? Uh, Someone said that the collaboration between groups to serve the customer better. Okay. We said DevOps as a kata, understanding the form is a sort of, um, form of practice. The organization needs to turn from practice into muscle memory. Um, like musicians or martial art artists group. Holistic view of modern production is a complex process beyond tasks, effort, pride, and results. So we see that. DevOps requires generosity and humility. Sharing is hard, especially when what you're sharing isn't perfect. I see DevOps as beautiful when it brings people together. Proving the health and the fitness of the whole organization from economic performance to employee satisfaction. It's kind of interesting there that uh, the focus is on the health and fitness of the whole org, but then actually thought of as the, the economic performance and then down to the employees. Uh, DevOps epitomizes the idea of empathy and cooperation. It calls people to work together, breaking down the silos of the to make people more aware of the humanity that exists behind their code. It's interesting that humanity is called out here. Well, I'll actually visit that uh, in a moment. Uh, I promise I'm not going through all 50. Um, this is the second one. The amazing DevOps outcomes that we love so much, high daily deploys, high reliability, lack of friction, are what results we need to be pushing forward single piece flow. So this person actually uh, was talking about the ideal in lean manufacturing. That's what he finds the aesthetic of DevOps. To be. This is my favorite one. DevOps at the center is in the high eye of the beholder, which is kind of a good point. So the ones that I read, these are the people uh, that were uh, um, in that list. Um, they, that's what they said. Um, I'm not going to tell you who said what, because I think it's kind of an interesting exercise. Knowing these are people on Twitter that are kind of, like I said, thought leaders, Gene Kim, uh, Dominica Durantis, um, John Willis, Patrick Blas in there. It's interesting to sort of ponder from what you see of them and what you've read of their work, which one would you match up uh, of that set of value? And, and then uh, if I gave you the answer, uh, if you were right around with that, what, what would you think about that? What would that, um, what would that prompt us to think about? So um, I find the variation fascinating, fascinating but know the threads of alignment in there. Even though some people are focusing on humanistic systems, there's an economic component in some of them. Um, the lean uh, manufacturing is very focused on that. So, so commonly uh, shared DevOps aesthetics. Automation, I think that's pretty, pretty key. Uh, or pretty well accepted automation. Infrastructure as code, we all kind of know what that is. It's kind of a look at if you're not doing it, there's sort of a question about you quote unquote doing the DevOps. So that's pretty well accepted. Systems thinking and value streams, this idea that we need to look at the entire flow of a commit from the developer's brain to out to production. Feedback groups, big deal. Collaboration and empathy, I think we all will spend a lot of time probably talking about these things. Winning and recognizable improvement. I put this in class actually because I thought it was interesting. I was reading a bunch of, of the responses and they were talking about uh, using DevOps to win, right? The, the subtitle of the Phoenix product is how to use DevOps to make your business win, right? It's been interesting that that's a sort of a shared aesthetic. These might be more difficult to agree upon than our, our DevOps community, and especially our worldwide DevOps community. The IRS is EMAS. <laughs> Long discussion, I don't know if we'll ever get a shared set on that one. Uh, application architecture, so containers, microservices, big monolithic monstrosities. I love my monstrosities. I'm going to break it up into little microservices. Right? It's something we'll probably talk about in a long time, especially because it's shifting so often. Um, who is allowed to say no in the organization? Going back to sort of Phil's comment um, at Facebook. Not all organizations are that bad. So, might be interesting to, to look at yeah, in your own work who is allowed and isn't allowed to say no. As a release engineer for a long time, uh, we weren't allowed to say no. Uh, humanity, humane system design, really is up because uh, this comes up a lot in the context of postmortems, on call staff. Uh, what does it mean to be humane? Right? And, it, and if you ever have seen uh, developers balk at the idea of I have to carry the pager, I have those other people carry the pager so they get paged at 3 a.m. I don't think it's really a That's really a discussion about humane system design. Does your system that you coded as a developer fail gracefully or do something reasonable as long as the site is still running as opposed to just page out to someone? Um, so you see a lot of talk about this, especially in a post-mortem context, um, resilient system design context. 
And of course, it includes inclusivity and diversity. I think there's an interesting conversation about uh, some people think DevOps implies inclusivity and diversity. And then that's something that everybody who does DevOps should care about. And I know people that are doing DevOps and they kind of don't care about either of those. Um, I'm not saying one's right or wrong. That's why it's a discussion. It's a discussion about the aesthetics that you think are important. Uh, let me slow it down. There's a kind of interesting, uh, the Kata community, the Toyota Production System Kata Improvement Community, um, sort of daily improvement stuff. Uh, they, they have a thing where they like to say, uh, to go fast, you need to slow down. It's interesting, like, as an organization or as a team, when is a good time to slow down? Is it, is it ever a good time to slow down? So, the list I just gave you, I like to call it elephant conversations, because they are the elephant that is in every room and every team space. Um, and there are a lot on there, obviously there are. It's interesting to think about what are the elephant conversations for you, for your organization. Uh, a couple of examples, one of the quintessential ones, Shanley uh, uh, does, does model view culture, she founded it. Um, she's talking about culture, and I just like this quote, uh, what true culture, or our true culture is made primarily the things uh, no one will say. And then she lists actually a bunch of things that are aesthetic values that people often uh, find difficult to talk about. Those are conversations maybe we're not having. Uh, this is one of my favorite books, uh, The No Haskell Rule, by a professor at Stanford, Robert Sutton. Um, this is an interesting question about how does the organization, what is their aesthetic of failure? Right? If I see a question for testing the organization's characters, what happens when people make mistakes? So I want to do a really quick small digression on loose taxonomies because uh, it came up, I think it's important, and I'll, I'll bring this all back together, I promise. Uh, John Willis, uh, Luke was talking about, uh, he was giving a, a state of DevOps in the uh, DevOps Day Chicago uh, just earlier, maybe three months ago. And uh, he was talking about uh, the one blue loose taxonomy cans and ice. Um, are people uh, familiar with cans? Or um, people are certainly familiar with DevOps as tools and culture. It's tools and culture. What is DevOps? It's tools and culture. And there may be some culture and some tools, right? So I want to uh, say that as that probably our first sort of original piece that I want. No, it is uh, tools and culture. And this is uh, Manny Wolfe from April of 2013, actually, talking about culture and tools and culture. So CAMS stands for Culture, Automation, Metrics, Sharing. It's something that Dan and Edward and John Lewis came up with. You see it a lot. There's a lot of discussion. In fact, they've got an entire presentation on it. So culture obviously fits in the culture problem. Automation is more of a tool than then. Metrics and measuring. How do you do that? What do you measure? That's a very tool-heavy. It's very technology-heavy. Um, might be a little culture-heavy, but I think it's mostly technology. Uh, sharing is obviously a cultural thing. Now, one of the things that uh, John talked about is a new taxonomy. We want to lose taxonomy. Uh, um, that Dave Zubak came up with called ICE. <coughs> and that was, uh, entitled something like Keep DevOps Cool with ICE. Um, the I stands for inclusivity. That's uh, clearly a cultural thing. He added complexity. What I think is interesting is complexity doesn't, doesn't really fit in culture or tools at all. So it might actually, of our kind of core set of tools and culture, we might add complexity as a different thing. And then the E is for empathy. So, where does this complexity thing come in, the, the conversation or the discussion? It's kind of, kind of an outlier, kind of out there. I put it in a different column. Well, we'll come back to Dave Snowden um, and his study on complexity. And his background is actually psychology, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, one of the, and he was quoted as saying, one of the ways you change how people think is to change their tools. So we're talking about like getting DevOps to the enterprise, DevOps growing and replicating and, and sort of as an idea and the way that we do our work. A lot of people say DevOps is going to become common sense. Well, how do we actually get that to happen if we think DevOps is the right way to go? We might change the tools. The example he gives is a cell phone, right? He says it takes about two years, by the way, any tool takes about two years to learn, but how many people just kind of instinctively when they need to check the time now go for their cell phone? I do. Uh, I've actually seen friends who got the Apple Watch still do that, <laughs> and they're like, all oh, right, I have, I have the watch. So I actually talked to a friend of mine who's uh, uh, getting his PhD in archaeology, 
and talking about tools and artifacts. And he was, uh, we were actually talking about it over beer, but he was saying artifacts are critical because they both represent and build society. They propagate it. Uh, the way we track cultural and human migration in a region is through tools and artifacts. So it's interesting to think about this in the context of, of uh, how trying to uh, sort of propagate uh, DevOps. So we started with talking about the tension of scaling and, and having it grow in different organizations. And so, you know, I really realized uh, now that we sort of understand aesthetics, we've talked about sort of what we mean when I'm talking about aesthetics for the purpose of this presentation, I kind of got it wrong. It shouldn't have been really the art of DevOps. It should have actually really been the artifacts of DevOps, right? Because those are the things that we can actually look at our outcomes and discuss. So, um, some artifacts of the DevOps movement. Uh, DevOps team topologies. What does the DevOps team look like? Infrastructure as code. Again, that's an artifact, obviously. Continuous delivery pipelines. Team incident response of crews. Interactions and conversations. There's a multitude of others. I'm not going to go through all of these. In fact, I'm only going to go through three. Um, but one of the things that's interesting to think about is what other artifacts might, might we put on this list? What, what other things generally that we could actually, or concrete things we could discuss? So let's just talk about three of them. Team, stop, team topologies. So these are various DevOps team topologies described by uh, Matthew Skelton. He's a consultant uh, in uh, England. And so he kind of looked at like the different types of dev and ops teams that you kind of see and that he had seen. So he kind of graphed them out. There's a blog post on this that has more context around these photos. Um, but you can see, obviously, there's, these are three, and then they kind of go in. And, uh, I don't know what happened to type, set, uh, type six. Somebody else suggested type uh, seven, KWD Hind on Twitter, uh, talks about the SRE team. And, the, and how that is kind of maybe different than Dev and Ops. It's a totally different thing. Um, so if we go back and we look at our loose taxonomies, but we look at them from the idea of uh, DevOps team topologies, we ask ourselves, well, from culture, you know, the topology is going to either foster or discourage a certain type of interaction. People have heard of maybe Conway's Law, this idea that uh, communication uh, or the design of the system follows the communication patterns, we might see that based upon our team topology. The tools, obviously, how do those teams communicate? Do they communicate with email, Slack? Uh, do they have custom tools just for doing handoffs, maybe? Who knows? It's interesting to think about. Uh, complexity. Um, what domain uh, is our team topology in, in terms of complexity space? I'm specifically sort of thinking about the Kinevin framework, which has a, a number of different domains to describe how complex a particular thing is. Um, so what, what domain is our, uh, our do the diff different team topologies fit into? More interestingly, actually, how would we transition from one topology to another it, it, without be very, doing a very jarring reorganization? Um, if we wanted to sort of manage the complexity, how would we do that? Um, of course, in uh, a team dynamic situation, complexity, if you've ever modeled the channels of, of uh, communication within a network, right? if you've got people and how many paths, and that goes up exponentially, um, that's directly related to team topology. So continuous delivery, it's big with enterprises. Uh, it's kind of interesting, the DevOps Enterprise Summit, uh, um, most of the enterprises there were actually just talking about continuous delivery. They didn't really actually talk all that much about DevOps. They kind of said, yeah, DevOps, and then they talked more about continuous delivery. It's kind of interesting. So again, if we look at this kind of model, um, the interesting thing about continuous delivery, one of the things that makes it really hard is it makes everything very visible, and that affects our culture. Some, some teams may not like the visibility that continuous delivery brings, so that can be difficult. Uh, rearranges some of the roles. So sometimes people doing different roles that they used to do uh, changes, and that, that could be jarring. Tools, there's lots of fodder here, a lot of continuous delivery tools. We could talk about that for a whole talk. Complexity, it's interesting to consider whether continuous delivery actually uh, tries to push things from the complex to the complicated to the uh, obvious domains. Again, those are Kinevin framings of that problem. But does continuous delivery actually push our release process, push the domain of that? It's kind of interesting to consider. Um, and finally, the one I want to talk about was sort of interactions and conversations. And again, I mean, obviously, there's a cultural impact there. And uh, I think it's important that we should look at that and um, Actually, Arup, can you put your phone down, please? Yeah. I need you to put your phone down. OK, thanks. Now let's step back for a moment. Who thought that was really uncomfortable? Yeah, OK. 
So what's interesting about that in talking about teams and interactions and the artifacts that we leave behind, I just sort of left an artifact behind. You probably have maybe formed an opinion about our relationship and, and maybe how I might treat people in an audience. Now, what's interesting in a work context, um, in a low trust environment, it would be easy to say, oh, well, Paul's just being a jerk, right? Maybe in a neutral trust environment, though, and slightly different, you might say, geez, those two people are kind of, that's a weird interaction, what's going on there? Now, what is really interesting in a high trust environment, you might go, wow, that's really odd. Both of those people's behavior, that's out of character for them. I wonder what's going on. And there's kind of two different context, contexts to parse what I asked Arup to do. One is, I want you to put your phone down because the website is blowing up, and I know you're the person that can help me with that, so I need your help with that. Might be one context. I'll give you another context that's pretty interesting. I was, having, I was working with a team, and we were in a meeting, and we had a no cell phones rule sort of in our meetings. And one, one of the guys, great engineer, a high trust environment, had his phone out and it kept buzzing. And he kept kind of looking at it, wasn't really involved in the meeting. And we had that interaction and, and he said, you know, uh, can we just talk, talk about it later? So I was like, okay, fine. And after the meeting, I found out that the night before his wife had had a miscarriage. So do you think he was there, uh, present of mind at work at that meeting? Probably not. We actually discussed it. He went home for the rest of the day after that meeting because that was more important. But that is certainly, if all of the, the only artifact you see is that interaction, the context suddenly becomes very important. Context is key. By the way, I know Arup, I asked if I could yell at him, so let's give him a round of applause for <laughs> letting me yell at him in the presentation. So, all right. Okay, let's loosen back up. All right, so a friend of mine, uh, Justin, uh, the archaeologist, says, a running joke among archaeologists, uh, archaeologists is when we don't know what something is, we just call it ritual, right? It's, relig it's a religious artifact. There have been a number of cases where they thought it was religious, and it turned out to be like cooking stones, like to keep the pot warm and stuff like that. So that's kind of fun, funny. All right, so DevOps, aesthetics, tools, culture, and artifacts. Oh, my. We talked about all of these today. And you might be going, well, so this is all kind of interesting. Maybe I learned a little bit about complexity. Um, what am I supposed to do with all of this? And I was talking with the organizers, and we were talking about the fact that um, it's important to have a takeaway. They wanted a concrete takeaway, because it's fun to talk about culture and, and aesthetics and what looks pretty, but it's not very actionable, um, other than maybe having a conversation. So these are the takeaways that I have for you. Don't avoid the elephants. Don't avoid those elephant conversations that I was talking about, especially as they uh, refer or relate to shared aesthetics. That's really important. Um, slow down to actually notice what might be an aesthetic conversation. Because these conversations, it's not like we're talking about, does your code look prettier than my code? It's really, should we use ZMQ or RabbitMQ, right? Or, you know, whatever. Um, there's aesthetics behind those conversations. This is one of my favorite John Ospaw from Etsy, John Ospaw quotes. Oh, that's just semantics, dismissively said by everyone who thinks words, language, and meaning don't matter. They do. Uh, in some sense, I think he's referring to this idea of, of the sort of aesthetics that we've been talking about. So pay attention to your artifacts. Takeaway number two, t pay attention to your artifacts. So understand the artifacts that you produce and that you contribute to producing. And a lot of times, we're walking through life producing artifacts. The example I gave you of the way I, I treated someone on maybe my team, it's a great example of an artifact that accretes over time. Uh, and we're often sort of not aware of it because we, we sort of do that. Um, and you have to look at those artifacts through this lens of a shared aesthetic. So does it contribute to the group aesthetic? Does it detract from the group's aesthetic? And by the way, that might be okay. What you're working on, it might be okay that it, it detracts from the shared aesthetic of the group, but it also might explain why it's not taking any, it's, you're not getting any traction with that particular artifact. Does anyone try to roll out a tool and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, I don't care, right? That's that kind of uh, effect going on. Um, maybe it's an entirely new aesthetic. So think about that. If it's a new aesthetic that you're trying to introduce, the way that you go through doing that, again, Snowden talking about tools, it's going to take a long time, two years. Uh, and you might introduce that to your teams a little differently. And finally, keep context front of mind. Um, as we saw, it's, it's really important. 
Um, you have to pay attention to the context, and more importantly, uh, your team's degree of context around the artifact. Uh, the great example of taking tools from Netflix and they don't, you know, tr trying to shoehorn them into our environment, it doesn't quite work right, right? That's because there's slightly different aesthetics there. In this particular case, um, talking about the unicorns and the unicorn company, companies isn't particularly useful if you're not Batman with an army of dolphins, right? So if you were to talk about the unicorns, it may not actually make sense. And finally, whatever this process of looking at the artifacts that you've created, thinking about the aesthetics uh, and evaluating them, whatever that process is for you and your team, make time to appreciate the beauty and things done well. Thanks.